All right, let's first of all look at something really beautiful. What you can see on the on the left in the middle is a plastic scintillator, on the right in the middle is a sodium iodide scintillator. Now let's shoot a high energy photon beam into that and see what happens. So you can see both scintillators start to glow as the photon radiation hits them. And uh, you can see the camera being hit by uh, lots and lots of stray radiation as well. It's far away from the center beam, but uh, still getting a lot of stray radiation. And uh, the, the continuous noise in the background that you can hear is the linear accelerator in operation, producing this 18 mega electron volts photon beam. And the gamma scout is clicking as it is exceeding uh, the dose limit. And uh, the actual true dose rate right there on the scintillators is approximately 10 gray per minute. What you can also hear is the faint noise of uh, some detectors clicks, of the load lumps clicks, turning into a uniform noise. Now uh, let's have a look at that actually. What you can see here is a uh, load lump 3 with an attached neutron scintillator. It only detects neutrons, so it only sees uh, maybe about 6 impulses in 10 minutes at normal background radiation. But uh, if we switch on a linear accelerator, that will make a difference. Whoops, exceeding the scale. Well, we have to switch on to uh, like times 10 scale and try again, I guess, because um, there's more than 5,000 impulses per minute right now. Let's try again. I assume it's a lithium iodide scintillator, but I did not get any data sheet with it, by the way, so... And, uh, now we switch it over to times 10 scale, and you can see we're getting pretty much like 15,000 counts per minute. That is solely from neutron radiation. This detector is not at all sensitive to gamma radiation, to anything else but neutron radiation. And you can see there's only neutron radiation, and this produces 15,000 counts per minute. But wait, the linear accelerator is just giving off x-rays, so photons, it's not giving off any neutrons. So what, what exactly is happening here? I also tried to place a really old camera directly into the main beam, but uh, recording failed, as the memory card actually failed. Um, but we got an interesting recording of the aftermath of this irradiation of the camera. What you can see here is lots and lots of dead pixels on the imaging sensor, but also you can see intermittent flashes, like these white little flashes that just pop up, like, for, I don't know, a brief time, a fraction of a second. And that is actually the camera detecting itself. That is flashes of radiation that are coming from the camera, meaning that the camera is radioactive. Camera has been turned radioactive by the linear accelerator's beam by the photons. But just how exactly can this be? Well, we have to take a closer look at the underlying physics of why a linear accelerator beam totally wrecks your camera, while an airport scanner does not do much at all to your camera. Now, why is this happening? Both the linear accelerator, as well as, for example, an airport scanner, use the same type of radiation, photons, or x-rays. They are generated in a different way, one uses an x-ray tube, the other one uses a linear accelerator, but it's still the same type of radiation. So, uh, what's the difference between those types of radiation, and why doesn't the airport scanner damage my equipment and destroy my camera during one scan, but a linear accelerator destroys it or damages it severely in a fraction of a second? The difference is the energy. The energy of photons, or x-rays, used in a conventional airport scanner can be a maximum of 150 kV, but it's usually much lower than this, but it doesn't really matter if it's 150 or just 30 kV, we'll see why. Well, a linear accelerator beam is very high in energy. Uh, this beam that I was using had 18 mega electron volts. So, a kilo electron volt, or kilovolt, is a thousand volts. And this is a million volts. So this had 150,000 volts of energy. And this had 18 million volts of energy. Now why does this matter? 
we have to have a look at the interactions of photon radiation in order to understand this. Drawing while looking through a camera doesn't work too well, but anyway, we have different probabilities of effects depending on both the atomic number, but largely depending on the energy of the photon radiation. We have the photo effect, where a photon will strike an electron from an atom in matter and uh, get absorbed entirely. It will ionize this electron, the electron will fly off and again ionize on, same as a beta minus radiation, electron radiation, and the photon will be absorbed completely. From even the higher energies on, the uh, dominating effect will be the Compton effect, where the, the electron uh, gets ionized as well, but the photon does not give off its, its entire energy to the electron, but instead the photon lives on and gets uh, diffracted into a different direction like this and then can ionize another atom again. And at even higher energies, where you have to have at least uh, double the resting mass of an electron, while the resting mass is 511 kV, so double that will be 1.022 mega electron volts or 1022 kilo electron volts you can actually have pair production. A photon in that case will come very close to the core, interact with the Coulomb field and actually turn into particles. Yes, turn into particles. The photon disappears, the electromagnetic wave disappears and instead of that an electron and the antiparticle a positron will be emitted. This happens out of Einstein's very famous formula. So, anyway, as you can see, uh, energy can be exchanged into mass and vice versa. So uh, this, is, this is one strong interaction that occurs, but you just end up with uh, electron radiation that is like, like beta radiation that might have some kinetic energy. And uh, that just flies around pretty much like beta radiation. It's, it's not that dangerous or anything. It doesn't do anything yet. But from very high energy radiation on, photon radiation, with uh, approximately 6 MAV, that's uh, where this effect starts to be significant, can actually enter the nucleus of an atom. So it does not stay outside and interact with uh, the electron shell, so with just the Coulomb field. It turns right into the core and it excites the core. It does so very similar to like throwing a ball add uh, a piece of jello or something, you know, the, the jello will start to vibrate and uh, because, well, you, you pretty much transfer energy to this piece of jello that you were throwing the ball at and that's pretty much what happens as well. The photon enters the core and the core becomes excited. Now, um, in the best case, in the case of kind of low photon energies, uh, it's quite simple, another photon gets emitted and that's pretty much what happens to that, so not much of a change to the nucleus, it just gets excited for a while and then it emits a, a photon again, and that's fine. But uh, if the energy is actually high enough, if the photon energy is high enough um, to liberate one of these nucleons, that is the protons or the neutrons from the atom, then a significant change in the atom or in the entire molecule will occur. So if this energy, if the photon energy, exceeds the binding energy of the weakest bound nucleon, and this nucleon can be emitted. So, for example, a neutron could be emitted, and then you're left with neutron radiation. Or a proton could be emitted, and you're left with proton radiation. Or entire alpha particles, so two protons, two neutrons, could be emitted from the core, same as in uh, radioactive decay from, for example, uranium. Or, on very high photon energies, you can even split the atom's nucleus. Like in a nuclear reactor, you can split atoms. Now, neutrons, for example, are very powerful particles. They can go into other atoms and uh, turn a stable atom, a non-radioactive atom, into a radioactive atom, which again emits rays, uh, like gamma radiation, emits alpha particles, something like that. And of course, even the initial atom will be changed. I mean, if it loses a proton or a neutron, it will become either a different isotope or a different element altogether. And that, of course, uh, alters the, the binding of the molecules and, and everything it does. It does so with the human DNA, it does so with electronics, it does so with everything in a way. So once you have high enough energies to actually liberate the, the very pieces that the atom's core is made out of, 
then you have, well, kind of big troubles, I guess. Even though uh, ionization from, uh, just let's say, it's 150 kV photon, it's not able to enter the core, it's not able to produce pairs, it's not able to do anything much, but, uh, for example, Compton effect, or most likely the photo effect, so there will be electrons flying around, and of course that's like, you know, if a lot of electrons are flying, that's pretty much charge that is liberated. And uh, that is supposed to do something as well, like flip the bits off of memory cards and everything. But these effects are not noticeable unless you really, really bombard the, uh, the hardware. When you switch off 150 kV or anything, even 1 MeV of photon radiation, if you switch that off, there's no more radiation. Radiation will be gone entirely. However, if you have these kind of effects, you know, if you change the atom and uh, remove an, a nucleon from it, it may just be a radioactive atom, and it may have a long half-life, it may have half-life of years at worst, though most activation products are just uh, with a half-life of well, a couple of minutes at max, but the thing is, if you use an ATMEV beam and switch off the beam, so, we put the... I can't draw a switch. Anyway, you switch off the beam, so it's off. Then, you still have radiation around. And that is because the things around you have become radioactive due to this very high energy photon beam and the act interactions it did with the nucleons, with the cores of the atoms, by removing protons and neutrons, which again are flying around, being absorbed by other atoms, turning them maybe into radioactive atoms as well, and, and so on and so on. So that's why you have these, these very massive interactions. A uh, very high energy photon beam actually turns stuff radioactive. It even turns the air radioactive. It turns people radioactive. So during radiation therapy, people will be radioactive. Not so much, because people are just made out of very light material, a lot of water, which is like hydrogen, oxygen, there oh, will be some carbon inside and everything, so people are not too radioactive. It's not like people are radiation hazard when they come out of radiation therapy, but they will be radioactive. Just a little bit. It's much less than you get during, for example, a nuclear medicine scan. Much, much less. But yeah, the air will be radioactive, so you should stay out of the room for, like, uh, up to a minute until the air gets suctioned out in the linear accelerator's room because uh, that radioactive air could otherwise end up in your lungs and if you do that all the time because you work there then it's supposed to increase your dose in a well, kind of drastic way that should be avoided. So, the conclusion, high energy photon beams change the atom's nuclei by liberating protons and neutrons potentially making stuff radioactive. So, that's why you can see this damage, that's why you can see these flashes. Now let's have a closer look again. So, you remember how I told you that these high energy photon beams can remove protons and neutrons from atoms nuclei and thus turn them into radioactive atoms? Or uh, those flying protons and neutrons could end up in other atoms and thus uh, make those radioactive if they capture the neutron or proton and turn them into the radioisotope? So, um, aren't we making the scintillators radioactive right now? Shouldn't we be able to detect them on the gamma spectrometer? Shouldn't we be able to use them to confirm that we're actually uh, facing a sodium iodide scintillator and not a cesium iodide scintillator? Well, sure we can. Let's have a look. Iodine from the scintillator is a monoisotopic element. It only consists of one isotope, that is, stable iodine-127, but what we can detect here are the characteristic gamma energies that belong to iodine-126. So that means that the photon beam actually removed a neutron from the core, which was most likely the weakest bound nucleon, and thus turned it into radioactive iodine-126. Now, what do we have in the scintillator as well? It's a sodium iodide scintillator, so uh, there should be a sodium line at some point. Well, uh, this is probably wrong. It shows yttrium. It's probably from, from other stuff, like from the encasing, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the the tiny bits of thallium became. Some of this is misidentified. This one even says, uh, what's, the, what's the English word for that again? I forgot. Now you can see 
we have a gamma g of 666 kV there. That's pretty cool. Uh, and what you can see here in the high energy area is sodium-24. Now, uh, sodium-23 is a natural isotope, and if it captures one neutron, it becomes sodium-24. And that's what happened. So you can see that some of the neutrons that were liberated from the iodine probably end up in the sodium, and thus both the iodine as well as the sodium turned into radioisotopes. Of course, there were also neutrons flying around from other atoms, from the shielding, from the table, from the room, from uh, the floor, from everything like that. So it's not necessarily that an iodine neutron was captured by a sodium atom, but, well, these interactions surely happened and it's quite fun to see. By the way, it's, it's not very radioactive. It's only detectable with a very sensitive device, not with a standard Geiger counter. So after just one tiny irradiation, it's not really a radiation hazard. But it looks awesome, so I really hope that you enjoyed the view as much as I did. Thanks for watching.